the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, the Soviet fighters' small ammo, special, abandoned town in the mountains, and metal beasts, air superiority, the American way. Today, we're beginning to tell you about the new vehicles introduced by the Danger Zone update. And you're probably familiar with this metal beast. The first fourth generation fighter and the latest member of the Grumman feline family, a famous actor, and a pretty hard boiled aircraft. All of this is the top American carrier based plane, the F 14A Tomcat. We often admire the shapes and grace of combat aircraft, but this machine feels like a different breed altogether. With its wings spread wide, the Tomcat looks like it just left the gym after a workout, straightened its back, and flexed its muscles, the tough steel muscles of an American plane. With the wings swept back, it's a swift, ruthless hunter, streamlined and whole like an arrowhead. Still, it's great in more than just the looks. The aircraft's power plant is two turbojet engines with afterburners. The space in the wing and the fuselage is occupied by fuel tanks. The nose cone hides the onboard radar station, and under the cockpit, we can see a 20 millimeter autocannon with an ammo pool of 676 rounds. The plane's eight hardpoints can carry bombs of various calibers, rockets, and guided air-to-air -air missiles with infrared and radar-guided homing devices. As per its design, the F-14 focuses on air combat. Two powerful engines provide fairly good acceleration and climb rates, while its perfect aerodynamics and great structural integrity allow it to accelerate up to 1,500 kilometers per hour near the ground. Very few top fighters can boast this capability, and that feature dictates the optimal combat tactics for the Tomcat, energy fighting. The Tomcat's pretty good in dogfights too, but only at high speeds. It quickly loses energy if you try to turn to the enemy too quickly, making it an easy target. Which means you might want to try and stay away from the dangerous area in combat. The Tomcat can carry a hefty arsenal of air-to-air -air missiles to improve its chances, aided by a vigorous radar system capable of locating and tracking targets across the entire battlefield. For long-distance attacks, this American plane can carry the famous Phoenix missiles. Their engines work in eco mode to provide maximum flight distance. However, that also means the missile's dynamics are inferior to medium and short-range counterparts. The Phoenix missiles can't boast a high maneuverability either. After all, they were created to intercept heavy-laden bombers and cruise missiles, so basically any fighter can dodge them if they spot the approaching trail quickly enough. On the other hand, the AIM-54 has an obvious advantage, the combined homing system. For the majority of the flight, the missile tracks its target using the carrier plane's reflected radar. But sometime before the hit, it switches to its own radar, and the F-14 doesn't have to track it anymore. Still the backbone of the Tomcat's firepower in War Thunder is composed of the familiar Sidewinder and Sparrow missiles. These are way more suitable for close combat. Here's what we believe is a perfect loadout. Two Phoenix missiles in the back, under the fuselage, two AIM-7 in front of them, and IR-guided AIM-9 for the wing hardpoints. As a last resort, the Tomcat can also use its trusty old 20mm Vulcan, the quick-firing autocannon. The F-14 isn't that great at attacking ground vehicles, and outright bad if you compare it to versatile Phantoms. A few Zuni rockets and conventional bombs with calibers up to 2,000 pounds can destroy tanks, and there's even a ballistic computer to aid your aiming, but the Tomcat has nothing to fight enemy air defense with. Which means it had better stay a pure air superiority fighter in mixed battles. We've seen a few comments asking, why did early Soviet fighters have such small ammo pools? Look at the American machines, thousands of slugs for large caliber Brownings, or German ones with their gun pods and hundreds of Meningoschuss rounds. 
As it often happens, the answer to this question is much more complicated than it might seem at first. Those fighters' small ammo pools were a result of a whole range of factors. We can't even list them all, but we can try to group them and talk about the most influential ones. First, the fighters the Soviet Union had when it entered the war were vastly different from their original designs. The Yak-1 and Lag-3 had been designed to use powerful M106 engines. However, the Soviet industry failed to provide these motors or turbochargers for them by 1941. Take a look at the I-301, the Lag prototype. Four machine guns, two of them large caliber, and a big 23mm engine cannon. Now here's the production Lag-3 with a Schwuck and a single machine gun. Quite a difference, right? The production lag model had to lose a lot of its firepower, and the main reason for that was its M105 engine. It was weaker than the 106, but at least it was already mass-produced and in stock. A similar replacement happened to the I-26. Knowing how low the firepower of the first Yak-1 was, their designer Yakovlev had developed a wonderful I-30 fighter before the war. It was basically a Yak-1 remade in metal, lighter, and armed with no less than three Schwuck cannons and two synchronized machine guns. However, the start of the war, the need to evacuate the industries, and the shortage of Dural buried the plans to mass-produce them. And now we're approaching the second group of reasons. The extremely untimely beginning of the war, the evacuation, and eventual loss of a major share of Soviet industries led to a noticeable shortage of rounds and aircraft ordnance. The Soviet fighters represented in blueprints and design papers were a sort of perfect image of those aircraft. In reality, the Yak and Lag planes could not have the Schwuck engine cannons and instead had to be assembled with, for instance, Berezin large caliber MGs. Even the later La 5 aircraft would sometimes only have a single Schwuck and a single large caliber MG. The Red Army Air Force only managed to solve the ammo shortage issues by the summer of 1943. Wouldn't you agree that large ammo pools weren't a priority? By the way, it wasn't even an issue either. Why? Well, here goes reason number three for the small ammo pools in Soviet aircraft. It has to do with the mindset of Soviet fighter pilots. Before being sent to battle, they were taught flying and firing techniques. They were taught not to be afraid of getting close and personal with the enemy, hitting them with raking fire, or as they'd say back then, hitting in the rivets, altitude, speed, maneuvers, fire, and would an enemy messer or fock of wolf need much if each round hit it straight and true? No long, wasted volleys, only a single, quick, devastating blow. That's why Soviet pilots would often lighten their fighters, leaving the entire machine gun ammo on the ground and only loading the engine cannon. When the aircraft engineers had an experiment and installed the 37mm NS-37 cannons onto the lags and the yaks, the pilots almost cried for more of those planes. And they got them. First, the Lag-334, the Yak-737, and then the Yak-9T. The Aracobras with their 37mm cannons weren't as popular among the Allies, but the Soviet pilots loved them, unlike the Kitty Hawks, Mustangs, and Thunderbolts with their numerous Brownings. Did those large caliber guns come with a lot of ammo? No, not really. What they did come with was a great opportunity for the Soviet pilots to follow their favorite style, deliver a single devastating close-range hit, or take out some junkers with a sniper shot around a kilometer away. As is tradition, we're telling you about new locations in War Thunder after each update. And today's new location is the abandoned town. Let's start with its southern part. It's separated from the rest of the map by a small mountain stream. You can either ford it or cross it via one of the bridges. Winding asphalt roads go past three-story buildings on one side and an industrial area on the other. Between them, on an intersection next to the main bridge and a small hill church, we can see point A, the main combat area in the part of the map. A cableway is seen here, connecting the mountain to the center of the town. And that's where we'll go next. Let's follow the main bridge past the recreation center. Here we can see the main part of the town stretching along the valley. 
blocks of three, five, and nine-story buildings decorated with tile mosaics, wide and narrow streets piled with cars, colorful garages in the yards, small shops, and a cinema. All in all, it's a pretty regular small town. It does have some southern accent to it, though. Lush trees and bright green bushes are saying it loud and clear. Nature will soon retake everything humans have tried to create here. Here, in one of the central yards of the town, we can see Point B. It provides much more cover than the southern point. Thanks to a more sophisticated layout with irregular blocks in the southeast and a lack of straight streets in the northwest, you can reach it with no enemy encounters on the way, which means all kinds of vehicles will be fighting large-scale battles to control the center of the town. Moving on further north, past the overgrowing football field, we see the town border. This small, flat area, tightly squeezed by rocky slopes on all sides and full of small brick houses, is where Point C is found. The area seems pretty open, but that's a wrong impression. There's enough cover here. Only the most mobile tanks can quickly gain control over this area. They can sneak into this appendage to the main part of the town, hide behind the buildings, and wait out the capture. Then occupy a comfy position under the slope on the enemy side and meet the advancing enemy with a surprise flank attack. Still, even the hottest battles cannot destroy the charm of this place. The mountains are simply majestic. Their green slopes and snowy peaks are easy to spot even from the town, but the truly impressive view is found at a few kilometers above sea level. It's truly worth taking a minute to enjoy. Share your impressions of the new location in the comments, we'll be happy to read them. And now it's time to answer some of the questions you asked us commenting on our previous episodes. The first question was sent by a player called Takeo Nakazato. Is it true that there's an ultra low quality setting? If so, how do I enable it? Hello, Takeo. The settings you need are found in Options, Graphics, Old Video Card Support. Capable Secret 4 asks, what's the best way to play T55A? Hi there. The T55A tactics depend on what enemies it encounters. This Soviet machine's armor can handle AP and capped rounds, allowing it to advance in the front but it can't meet enemies armed with discarding sabot or high explosive rounds head on. We recommend you use capped rounds as your main projectile on the T-55, while the APF-SDS will do for the thickest targets. Another question comes from Hax Melper. Which aircraft can carry the heaviest bomb load? Hi Hax, the Soviet Tu-4 strategic bomber is currently the one with the heaviest load up to 12 tons of bombs. American Hat writes, on the German SF-40 barges, could a torpedo go under the middle section between the two pontoons or would the hitboxes prevent that? Howdy. Exactly like in real life, a torpedo can easily go between the pontoons. Here, take a look. And the last comment for today was written by Kaka Kiri. Can we put an SPG, tank, or MBT on a battleship deck? Hi, Kiri. It's entirely possible since the deck would have enough space and even the heaviest tanks are super light compared to a ship. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, don't attempt to pet a tomcat no matter how cute it looks, and see you next week.